Wow. <laughs> yep. Hey, guys, uh, we are about to jump into the sermon, but before we do, we need to take some time and, and just talk about something else. I want to remind you of uh, the, the part of the text that I ended with from Habakkuk last week. In Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk, knowing impending destruction is, is on the horizon, says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord." I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Um, you know, I brought that passage out last week and talked about no matter what happens, we should be able to praise God. And this week we have seen... A man tried to go into a church and kill people, and when the church was locked, he went to a grocery store and killed people just because of the color of their skin. This week, we've seen bombs mailed to people because of political party affiliation. And then yesterday, that terrible atrocity and display of evil that happened in the synagogue in Pittsburgh. And I just find it really appropriate. That I, was, I thought about just starting the service today with some prayer about that, but I thought, no, better to start with praise. Better to start with worship because that gets us focused where we need to be. Better to hear this song about the majesty of King Jesus because that's what we need to keep in mind. And isn't it great that when we gather here today after a week like we've had, we have in the room Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians, and who knows what's it's. We have in the room all kinds of skin colors, all kinds of age groups. And I sat here a minute ago when we were just using the guitar, and I heard all our voices just singing the same thing. No division. And... Uh, I just kind of wish we could stay here all week and doing that. And I just want us to take some time and pray. We need to pray for the victims of these horrific acts. And we need to pray for ourselves because I'm telling you, I see Christians get down. And I see Christians helping divide the country further. And not because of our faith, but because of our political affiliation. Can we just spend some time in prayer? Holy Father, you are worthy to be praised. And we praise you, even with heavy hearts today. We praise you, even after people have been threatened, people have been killed. And God, we are praying for the soul of our nation. And we're praying for the soul of your people. And how good to come here and realize that in Jesus, there's no division. And Father, I pray that we would be a people who would take that message to the world, that we would be... We would stop worrying about taking our political message and that we would take the gospel to the world above all things. God, we want to we wanna lift up the survivors of that synagogue attack as they are grieving so heavily right now. Father, we're praying for our Jewish friends all over as they're all suffering and grieving from this. We pray for them as they go to synagogue next week, wondering what awaits them. And Father, we pray that they would 
find the hope and the comfort that is in Jesus. Father, we pray for our political leaders. So many of them are just so angry and so divisive, and it seems like there's just so little common sense and respect and decency. And we pray that you would help them see other human beings as human beings created in the image and likeness of God and therefore worthy of respect. God, I pray that you would help Republicans and Democrats be friends with each other. We pray for the racial violence and animosity in our country. We know it's out there. And I pray that it would never find a home in our lives. And I'm thankful that it doesn't seem to have a home at Central. Father, help us to be agents of unity and love and peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, you said. Not just peacekeepers, but peacemakers. And Father, I want to thank you for our law enforcement community. I'm so thankful for the good work done that captured that bomb maker, so quickly. Thank you for the law enforcement that showed up and arrested the guy in Pittsburgh. And we're thankful for those that are putting their lives on the line day in and day out, and we pray for their protection. Father, as we look around, we, we know that there are all kinds of policy and legal issues that need to be resolved. God, we acknowledge in this moment that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the solution. And so help us to make a difference. So in this time, we just commend ourselves to you for your good purposes. And as we prepare to open your word together, I pray that we would be open to your word as it is a very timely and appropriate message for us today. So speak to us, please. Speak by your spirit, through your word, into our hearts. We pray in the strong and matchless name of King Jesus. Amen. And I will tell you that I I can't imagine coming upon a more appropriate passage for us to look at today. We are in the book of Zephaniah. We are going through the Bible, a book at a time, a week a book. And today we are at Zephaniah. And I just want to tell you, I understand that the prophets are hard. You know, if you're going to have your quiet time, you're probably not going to turn to Nahum or Habakkuk or Zephaniah most of the time. Or if you do, you might turn to Habakkuk chapter 3 and that one passage, but probably not to read the whole book about this destruction that's coming from the Chaldeans. You're probably not going to go to Nahum and read about the judgment that's coming on Nineveh. And I get that, and a lot of that is because it's hard to understand. There seems like there's, seems like there's so much judgment in the prophets. Uh, there's a lot of figurative language. It's hard to figure out. There are a lot of names and places and events that maybe we're just not very familiar with. And so when we read the prophets, a lot of times we're left scratching our heads thinking, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Why do I need to know this? And so that's why I feel like the the most helpful thing we can do when we're reading really all of the Bible, but especially these Old Testament prophets, is to understand what's going on in their day. We need to understand their historical context, their their community context, their geopolitical context. We need to know why they're saying what they're saying. And for example, it makes all the difference in the world to know that Zephaniah prophesied during the reign of King Josiah 
in Judah. Now, didn't that make all the difference? It didn't, but it will. Let's go with some background, and let's start with Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the very few good kings that we see in the life of the Israelites. Throughout all their history, he's one of the very few good ones. Hezekiah was a good king. He made a lot of reforms. He got people focused on God. He actually restored the Passover, which had not been kept. He did have a period at the end of his life where he started showing some pride, some hubris, and God not Knocked him down a few notches, but uh, overall, his was a, a good reign. And then he had a son named Manasseh. Now, when Manasseh was 12, Hezekiah made Manasseh the co-regent. This was not something that was uncommon. And you would see this with kings, with their young sons. And what they would do is they would actually make them the co-king sort of as a baton pass. They were preparing them, and they were bringing them into the inner circle and giving them responsibility to train them up for when they died. And sure enough, Hezekiah died when Manasseh was 21, and Manasseh proceeded to become the absolute worst king they had ever had. I mean, this guy invented ways of being evil. He rebelled against all of his father's reforms. He set up altars to pagan gods throughout the land. He even set up pagan altars within the temple of God. He practiced magical arts. He consulted psychics. He practiced witchcraft. He even offered his own children in sacrifice to pagan gods. So all of Judah, of course, followed suit, and Scripture tells us that at this time, Judah became more wicked than all of the nations who lived in the promised land before them. They were more wicked than the Philistines at this point. In the end, Manasseh showed some humility, but he didn't, in, 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 he didn't uh, bring in all the reforms of his father. In his total reign, 55 years, this wicked king sat on the throne for 55 years. He was succeeded by his son Ammon, who did everything bad his dad did. Ammon was not a good king, and so all his servants got together and conspired to kill him, and they killed him after he'd been reigning for only two years, but he had a son named Josiah. Now, Josiah became the king when he was eight years old. Can you imagine that? So here's Josiah, the king, and it actually is working out pretty well because he had some godly counselors, some godly advisors that were helping him, but something remarkable happened because God touched this young boy's heart, and when he was 16 years old, he began in earnest to seek the Lord. He started issuing decrees to have the altars of the pagan gods taken down. In fact, he had the idols of these pagan gods ground to powder, powder and had the, had the powder, the, the grounds, spread over the graves of anyone who worshipped them. He was trying to get it right. And when he turned 26... He sent some people to repair the temple. And when they were repairing the temple, they found a book. You guys, it had been so long since they'd seen the Word of God or heard the Word of God. This was just a novelty to them. So they find this book, and they take it to Josiah and say, hey, we found this. And he starts reading the Word of God, and he was just grieved. He did not know how far they had strayed. He was grieved, and he was repentant, and so he brought all the people in, and he himself, the king, started reading and teaching from the book of the law. He renewed the covenant, and Scripture says, now get this, this is important, he made all of the people agree to the covenant. For the remaining 13 years of his life, it was good. It was just good. People did what the king said. And it was during this time. I want you to think about this. This is what's so important. It's during this good, peaceful, prosperous, worshipful, Passover-keeping, law-keeping, word of God teaching and obeying time that a relative of Josiah's named Zephaniah comes on the scene and prophesies destruction. It's fascinating that during one of the best times in the history of the southern kingdom, 
Zephaniah prophesied. Zephaniah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal in the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. Milcom was a pagan god. So they were swearing to the God of the Bible as well as this pagan god who, by the way, demanded child sacrifices. Those who have turned back from following the Lord who do not seek the Lord or inquire. And skip down to verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. Sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there, a day of wrath. Is that day a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements? Now we look and go, wait a minute. They're in the middle of revival. People are reading the Bible. People are doing what it says. People are going to the temple and, and worshiping God, and everything's good in the land. They have a good king. But the problem is the land was full of hypocrites. Outwardly, externally, everything was good. But that's just not enough. Specifically, I want you to see four lessons that I think are very appropriate and timely for us today. Four lessons from Zephaniah. Number one is this, good leaders are not enough. They had the best king. They had the best king. They got this young king who's bringing in these reforms, and he is completely sold out to God. He is God-centered. It's not enough. And I think a lot of times we have this mentality that as long as we can get good leaders, we're going to get a Christian nation. As long as we can elect the right people and put them in office, then everybody's going to turn it around and, and it's all going to be good. And we will restore America to being a Christian nation if we can just get the right leaders. Because the right leaders will enact the right laws and then we'll all be Christians. It's not enough to have good leaders. It's not enough to have good laws. Now, let me pause here. It's really important to have good leaders, I think. I think that's a biblical lesson. It's really important. I, I would love it if all our leaders were born again, sold out to Jesus Christians, who were not just sold out to Jesus, but who were godly and wise and thoughtful. Wouldn't that be great, y'all? I mean, I think it'd be, wouldn't it be great if all the laws they passed were laws in keeping with the Word of God, that all the laws they passed were for the good of the people and were equitable and just and promoted religious freedom and, and all the things that we value and promoted the sanctity of human life and promoted the sanctity of marriage? Wouldn't we love it if our leaders would do that? It would be great. But that's not enough. And the reason that's not enough is because... Ultimately, our fundamental problem is not laws. Our problem is hearts. We have laws that say you can't go in a synagogue and shoot it up. But there's an evil, perhaps crazy person that did it anyway. Our laws say, hey, you can't send bombs in the mail. But there's an evil, perhaps crazy person who did it anyway. Our laws say we're all created equal in the sight of God. And you got a guy going into a store and killing people just because of the color of their skin. The laws are not enough. Our greatest need is not more Christian politicians. Our greatest need is more Jesus-loving Christians sharing the good news with as many people as possible because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that's actually going to change hearts. A good law never changed anybody's heart. And a Christian politician or political leader never brought revival or spiritual awakening. 
Good leaders are not enough. Second lesson, good religion is not enough. They had all the right religion. They were worshiping at the temple. The temple had been restored. It had been cleaned out. They're doing all the things. The, the Passover had been kept. They were keeping all the feasts and the festivals. Everything they were doing, these people had really good religious resumes. Let me tell you about some other people that had really good religious res resumes that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7. He talks about a day when some people will come and say, see my resume? See all the awesome things I did for you? They're going to say, hey, I prophesied in your name, Jesus. I cast out demons in your name, Jesus. I did all kinds of mighty works in your name, Jesus. And Jesus is going to say what? Get away from me. I never knew you. Having the right religious res resume isn't going to keep you from hell. Now, I, I do want to say religion's not bad. I think we have this conversation going today. You know, you ever hear this? It's not religion, it's relationship. Of course it's religion. Based on a relationship. Christianity is a religion. It's a religion. What, what are we doing here today? We're doing religious things today, y'all. Whether you want to admit it or not, we're getting together, we're singing, we're reading scripture, we're offering prayers, we're giving money, we have a religious ritual called baptism. We're doing all these things. It is religion. And the Bible talks about good religion. So there's good religion and there's bad religion. But here's the point, and here's what we want to emphasize. Religion never saved anybody. Because you can come in here and do all the religion and not be a real Christian. You can even get baptized and not be a real Christian. We try to prevent that, but that's in your heart. So religion, good religion, is important, but it never saved anybody. So good leaders are not enough. Good religion is not enough. Good teaching is not enough. They had the king who was arguably the, the most educated man around. He had all the educated people teaching him. He could actually read. He's reading the law. He's reading it to the people and teaching the people and made them keep God's word. I was thinking, writing this sermon about a certain guy that had literally, and I'm using the word literally the way it's supposed to be used. He had literally the best teacher ever. It's a guy named Judas. Judas's teacher was Jesus. And he didn't just go to church on Sunday to hear Jesus teach. He lived with Jesus and traveled with Jesus for three, three and a half years, going everywhere with him. He heard Jesus preach and teach the masses, and he got to sit around the dinner table and hear Jesus teach. He got to sit, sit around the campfire and hear Jesus teach. He was out in the boat where he could hear Jesus teach. He had the best teacher Ever, and he was a liar and a thief and a betrayer. Having a good teacher didn't make any difference in Judas's life. Now, again, good teaching, I think, really important. In fact, I hope you're getting good teaching here. That's, that's my goal. I hope you're getting good teaching here. I hope you got good teaching at 9 o'clock this morning. And I can just tell you that if you were in our Sunday school classes, you got good teaching at 9 o'clock this morning. I hope you get good teaching when you show up tonight. In fact, if you show up tonight, I really think you're going to get some good teaching, whatever class you go to. We, we emphasize good teaching. We believe in the importance of good teaching. But being taught's not enough. My friend Joe was in a restaurant while he was traveling one time, and he, he said, I wasn't eavesdropping. He said, but these two ladies made it impossible for me not to hear what they were talking about. And one lady just kept complaining about her church. Yeah, we're going to try another church. We're just so tired. We're so disgusted. We're so fed up. We just are not getting fed. Well, Joe kept listening, and this lady was so disgusted with her church because she wasn't getting fed. She was at First Baptist Atlanta. Charles Stanley was her pastor. Yeah. Can I suggest she was getting fed? She just wasn't eating. Good teaching is not enough if you don't receive it, if you don't internalize it, if you don't take what you learn and have it change your life. But can I say another thing about good teaching and being fed? At some point, you got to learn to feed yourself. When you have a baby, you, you know, the baby gets off the bottle, you, you spoon feed the baby, right? 
But after a while, you know, when the baby's 14, you, you don't want to be spoon-feeding anymore, right? And unfortunately, a lot of times what we have in church is Christians who've been Christians for 14 years or 24 years or 54 years who still want somebody to spoon-feed them. The only time they're ever exposed to the Word of God is when they show up and they're like, feed me, feed yourself. I want to feed you good meat, but you have to take some responsibility and, and grow yourself. So listen, you can listen to good Bible teaching all day long, but it's nothing without personal inner transformation by the Word of God. So good leaders are not enough. Good religion is not enough. Good teaching is not enough. And good community is not enough. These folks in Josiah's day lived in Judah. They lived where the temple was. They lived where the priests were. Okay, here's the deal. They literally lived in the capital of the promised land. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? I mean, they didn't have Texas back then. <laughs> I'm teasing, kind of. Um, but here's the thing. So many people think, well, if I can just join the right church. So what they do is go church to church to church to church. Every new thing, every fad, every the latest and the greatest comes along. I've got to find the right. I've got to find the right. I'm, I'm not doing well because I can't get in the right church. Again, being in a good church, very important. Very important. But it's not enough. Let's go back to Judas again. Think about his small group. I mean, you're in a small group, right? I, was, I go to Sunday school. I love going to Sunday school. That's my group, man. That's my small group. That's, I love being with those people. Judas was in small group with Peter and James and John. And Jesus was their leader. Being a member of a good church is really important, but it's nothing if you have not been transferred into the body of Christ. By Jesus. So good leaders, really important, but not enough. Good religion, really important, but not enough. Good teachers, really important, not enough. Good community, really important, not enough. Because there's something missing in all those things, and that's a changed heart. This is something, this is something that the people in Josiah's day, Josiah couldn't do this for them. And here's the thing, they couldn't do it themselves. They needed divine intervention. Zephaniah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Gather together, yes, gather, O oh, shameless nation. Before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord. All you humble of the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So here he's talking to people who do all his commands. Hey, you people who do all his commands, try seeking the Lord. You can do his commands without seeking him. We have to stop trusting our efforts or the efforts of others and seek the Lord. The New Testament does not say everyone who does really good will be saved. It says everyone who what? Calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When we call on him, we are changed on the inside. Look at, at Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. And as we look at this, I want you to see that there are results happening based on what God does. I want you to see the emphasis, though, on what God does. For at that time, the Lord says, look at this, for at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him. So you're supposed to seek the Lord, you're supposed to call on the name of the Lord, but God has to do something in your heart. Verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones. You shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. They shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. That's true conversion. It's when God changes you. So here's our takeaway for the day. 
This is the takeaway. Reform is not enough. You must be born again. In addition, this is what Jesus said to one of the religious leaders in John chapter 3. He had a religious leader come to him, came to him by night, started trying to talk all religious with him. And Jesus says, you must be born again. I mean, he just, Jesus always had a way of cutting right to the heart of the thing, the thing didn't he? You must be born again. Oh, what is that born again? How can I be born again? I've already been born. I can't go back and get born again. And Jesus rebukes this leader because he should have known this. He should have known that just doing good, keeping the law, having outward reform was not enough. You must be born again. Well, what does that look like? I want to share with you two results of true conversion that Zephaniah talks about. The first one is your joy. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Can I just tell you that your religion, your environment, all those things will not give you joy. In fact, do you know that religion can actually burden and oppress you? It can. If it's not good religion, it can burden you. It can oppress you if your heart is not in it. It can become nothing more than, oh, I've got to go to church. Oh, I've got to read my Bible. Oh, I've got to do all these things. And it can become a chore to you if your heart's not right. And, and people, your community, your leaders, they can let you down. Let me rephrase that. We can let you down. Let's think about Judas again. Great small group, right? He's in a small group with Peter who had a big mouth and was always bragging about how awesome he was. He was in a small group with James and John who secretly went to Jesus seeking preeminence. Hey, 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 Jesus, one of us wants to be at your right and one of your left in your glory. Don't tell them. He's, he's in a small group with Thomas. Now, this was after Judas, but Thomas, here's the kind of guy Thomas was. Thomas called all of the disciples liars. Hey, Jesus is alive. Don't believe you. We're in your small group, man. We've been with you three and a half years. Have we ever lied to you before? Don't believe you. That's who he's in his small group with. Listen, I hope here at Central you are blessed beyond measure by the people around you. Can I just tell you here at Central, Terry and I are blessed beyond measure by the people around us. But we don't depend on you for our joy. We like you a lot. We like being with you. But you're not the source of our joy. The only source of true, lasting joy is Jesus himself. And when you really know him, everything is different. But here, I want to talk about another result of true conversion that's not talked about that much, and it's God's joy. I love this one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Check this out, y'all. This is the coolest thing like ever. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You know what this is saying? God delights to save you. He exults over you with a vigorous and enthusiastic expression of joy. Have you ever thought of God singing over you? We come here to sing to him, right? You know what this says? God exults over his people, not just with singing. What kind of singing? Loud singing. How cool is that? God looks at us and starts singing. Because he's so full of joy for us. He loves to love you. you. You might be thinking, does he really know me? Preacher, you're talking about other people. He's not singing over me. Parents, you get this. When you have a new baby... 
And you have a new baby. What has that baby done for you? Robbed you of sleep? Filled you with worry? Barfed on you? Made you smell and see and do things you never thought you'd smell and see and do? And sometimes you just hold that baby close and you sing. You just sing. You praise God, don't you? I sent my daughter a link recently to a song, silly song. Doesn't matter what song it is. I sent her a link to a song. I said, this is the song that when I had you alone, when you were a little baby, I used to sing this to you. You know why? I just wanted to sing. Because of the joy that filled my heart over my children. When you stop trying to save yourself and you turn to Jesus, you are adopted into God's family. I know the world tells you, oh, no, no, we're all children of God. No, we're not. Only those who are in Christ are the children of God. And when you become one of his, he rejoices over you. Have you experienced the joy of knowing God? I hope you're not one of those people that thinks, man, if we can just get the right leaders, the right teachers, the right religion, the right community, we'll be all right. And I hope you'll turn to Jesus. I hope you'll come into his joy. In fact, today, wouldn't you come to Jesus and give God a reason to rejoice over you with loud singing? Let's pray. Oh, God, it's so maybe unusual for us to think of you singing over us. And I pray that if there's anybody here who has not experienced that kind of delightful, joyful, excited love from you, that today they would come and embrace you and know what it's like to be loved beyond their wildest imagination. So, God, would you do a work in hearts today? Help us not to be hypocrites. Help us not to be Christians outwardly only. And help us not to trust in those things that can't truly change people. Help us to be your people. Down to the bone, help us to be your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.